things in the country. Hello there. Welcome to the Gildavi Freddy Kisun Show. We come to you live three times weekly, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. As my co-host, Lenal Gildavi, would say, good evening, good night, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, social media reduces the, the world to one small room. So you may, you may be a Guyanese or Nova Guyana in Italy or in Norway or Malaysia, and you're looking at the program, so different time zones. We want to say again, good night, good morning, good evening. Welcome to the program, the Gildavi Freddy Kisun Show. We come to you live on the Guyanese Critic Facebook page, on Daybreak News page, and on YouTube. When this program started eight months ago, we enunciated a policy of giving unsung heroes, people not known by the Guyanese society the way they should be known, people we don't hear about, see, they're not talked about, but they go about their business very quietly, contributing to the well-being of this country. And we said as a policy, we will highlight those people. We will highlight organizations and individuals that need to be highlighted. And so far, we have featured all the small parties. We have given coverage to all the small parties, apart from the big ones. And we will start very soon to go through the pattern again, in which we will have these third parties or these small parties coming to talk about politics. This evening, we have a very unique individual who's been a friend of mine for 45 years. And he has contributed to the social fabric in Guyana in ways that many of you do not know. But tonight, we have a very talented man in our studio, and he is going to mix politics with art. He's a very consummate sculptor. And he's also a long-standing political activist. As soon as Leonard Gildari expresses his normal sentiments about the Guyanese society, we will introduce our guests. And it should be an interesting evening vis-a-vis -vis the achievements of this man. Over to Leonard, my co-host, um, and what he has to say. Good night, Freddie. Good night, folks. And of course, good night to our guests, uh, whom Freddie will uh, introduce in a very short while. Um, it is good to hear that there could be a mix between art and politics, and I like to see how that plays out. Interesting indeed. Um, you're going to see in a very short while when the camera pans out, uh, the two gentlemen in the studio, and one is an academic, at least he says that he is, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. That's me being a little funny there. Um, but the other one happens to be an artist, not an artist. And uh, that in itself uh, brings home to me the point of what we've been discussing the last couple of weeks. We had Mahadi Shivraj here, we had some actors here, and they will tell you about the plight of how difficult it is to exist. Yet their contributions uh, to the development of this country as part of what we know growing up, seeing on television, uh, uh, Ling Show and, and so many others. Uh, they, they, they're so uh, valuable to us uh, in our history of this country. Uh, but I'm going to leave Freddie to go into that because, as he says, he's more intimately um, uh, knowledgeable about the gentleman who is in our midst here today. Before, we, before I hand you over to my co-host back again, and let's get into that. Something came to my attention today, and I have written uh, in my days as a reporter, as a... As a young columnist at Kaichu News on housing in Guyana. And so I suffered immensely while building my house from contractors uh, beating the hell out of me um, to how do I apply for a mortgage? Um, how do you apply for the electricity that's being run to your house wiring? Um, <clears throat> over the years, I've listened to President Irfan Ali, um, who was the then Minister of Housing, talk about 
sustainable development and the value of lands. So when you buy a house lot from the government, let's say it's not developed, uh, you buy in that house lot, its location, uh, the monies that would have been spent, and a whole bunch of other stuff. If there's anything that could rapidly increase your worth is the ownership of property, movable property in Guyana and uh, right across the world. You could see it that some, it's one of the almost a short thing that really goes up in value over the years. Um, there's a big debate raging in, uh, in social media now about some houses that government is building. And uh, a lot of people are saying that the houses are not worth $5 million. I think it's located somewhere in Providence. Uh, so I was looking at a video today, and that video says that the houses are located right next to the new highway, um, the four-lane highway that is being built. Now, I live in 7th Street, Diamond, and if you know that uh, area there, the government ran a bypass from Mocker to Diamond. And right away, my property value went up because everybody, there's a road that's next to it that you could use. Uh, so if you're living at a corner, you could imagine that. Imagine you get a $5 million property. It's inclusive of the land and the house. And you're sitting right next to the, 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 the four lane. So we just cannot look at it. There are many people in Guyana who tell you, I, I'm going to live at a $5 million house. However, the question may also arise as to whether the property in itself that's being built, whether it's worth $5 million, it's a debate that is raging, and I think it speaks directly to the quality of work that our contractor puts out. But I just wanted to say to you guys that if there's anything that brings value to you, it, it, is, it is property, the house that you own. Um, and of course, we could have debate and healthy debates in this country, uh, as to what is good and what we should be paying attention to. But this is a conversation that should be, um, uh, uh, we should continue on a platform like this. But let me stop right there and let us continue. Thank you soon to our good guests here today. Yes, thank you, um, Gildavi. I met our guests 45 years ago. We were young, radical, idealist and hoping to change Guyana for the better. I met him after he came back from hiking or roaming uh, the countries of South America. At that time, I had a friend who did the same, a friend from Bar Street Kitty, who went hiking in South America and lost his way, lost his way and got killed by the Colombian guerrillas. So when I met my friend here, I, I mentioned that fact to him that you have to, how did you survive? You got to be careful in South America. That time in the early 70s, there was a lot of um, guerrilla activity. The Tupamaros in Uruguay, the guerrillas in Colombia fighting the um, Colombian government. So it was not easy like in the 50s when those white guys from Europe went hiking and my friend got killed. So that's how I met um, Desmond Ali and we became friends and started activities in the Working People's Alliance. I went on to university and he went on to become an artist specializing in sculpting and when you see this man's work, then you will see his talent. But there's a, there's a piece of his work that is inside, permanently inside, a prestigious <clears throat> international organization. Now, that is something you should know, that we have an artist that has a piece of sculpture that is permanently in the eyes of anyone who visits this institution. I'll show you that art. But let's introduce Desmond Ali, political activist and acclaimed sculptor and award-winning sculptor. Desmond, thanks for being here. You know um, Leonard Gildari, yeah. of course. Thank you very much, Freddie. Thank Gildari. you very much. Thank you, Ms. Viewers. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with something you need to know. You see what we said on this program when we started, that we hope to record history. I'm going to show you a piece of sculpture that I'm sure most Guyanese do not know. It's sitting right 
in the United Nations building permanently. Now, I'm, I'm not going to ask this morning. This is in New York? Yes. In New York, right? In New York, I have. At the United Nations in New York. Now, I'm not going to ask this morning. How much the UN paid him for it, etc., etc. That That's not for discussion. But this work, Art in Resistance, I'm going to show it, put it up there. That piece that you see that Desmond Ali is next to sits permanently in the United Nations. That is an achievement. From all the countries around the world, there's a piece of sculpture, believe it or not. There's a piece of sculpture which you're looking at here that sits in the United Nations headquarters in New York. Now, um, Desmond, let's talk about how this thing uh, came about to be in the United Nations. And first of all, I, I, I think it must... How do I put it without putting my foot in my mouth? It must be painful, for want of a better word, to see so many achievements of people all over the place. And you pick up the newspapers, you see on TV, uh, their recognition is there. And how many people, you know, I wonder if Gildavi knew this. I wonder how many people of the thousands that are watching this program knows that you have a piece of sculpture that sits in the United Nations head office in New York. How, how did that come about? And you, you, you were very young when that thing happened, as you could see. Exactly. He was very young, just <laughs> as young as I was in those days. But let me put it this way, right? Um, this work was um, acquired by the National Collection. And there, right, they had a number of pieces that were selected from the national collection. And among the pieces that were on display, they had sculpture and paintings. And the judges decided that this would have been the best piece of work. And this piece of work entitled Art of Resistance is on the architects of US military invasion of Grenada. You know, and that was a very sensitive topic at the point in time because Chinese never did work on geopolitics in the country, but my orientation in the arts in Latin America had given me an insight into the history of the re region. And these are shown in the picture. It shows the countries that had taken place in, in, the, um, in the invasion in Grenada. And it was amazing that the United Nations, you know, accepted it and said, well, this is a piece of work, you know, that shows our position and our, our, our position as relates to international relations. And we accepted this as they get from, from Guyana. And so this is permanently displayed from Guyana and our position in terms of how it is, non-intervention, you know, as it is. And you know, you got the experience of being in Grenada too, and you know yeah. what, what it meant for the entire region. And it's very relevant to the, the, the subject of non-intervention in the domestic affairs of, of countries. So when I brought into, into, into the Guyana's art was international relations and also what I, I started to do was reinterpretate the history, visual arts within the region from the perspective of a new world artist. You know, because the, the work that I've done here on the regional integration monuments are of pre-Columbian origin. You see, because most of the artists and being that we came through, through the process of colonization, most of the people were familiar with European art aesthetics. And what I, I brought into Guyanese art is an infusion for people to see now that before European presence, there were pre-Columbian presence, great architectures, great art. Well, I know, I know, I know what... Yeah, so you know. so um, this work here, right, is actually fa fashioned in a pre-Columbian method, right? And this here is the interpretation. But I know, I know, I know because of your travels in hitchhiking, in hiking, not hitchhiking, hiking, in Latin America, you bring the Latin and the pre-Columbian and the Aztec um, yeah. infusion into your work. But you know, there, there's one I'm wondering, I'm wondering if the people who go to the UN, Guyanese, Guyanese travel all the time, 
and there are Guyanese diplomats at the UN. We have an ambassador at the UN. I wonder when they go to the UN and they see this thing there, I wonder if how many of them know that this is done by a Guyanese artist. And you know why we are featuring this program tonight? We are featuring you tonight so it could go down in history, so Guyanese could know that there is a piece of work in the UN. Now, let's, let's, um, let's, you are one of the few artists in this country, and I've known, I've known artists, I've known many artists, but you're one of the few in this country, and that's what I like about you, who fuse your art with politics. If you look, I don't want to call him, if you look, even, even our novelists, even our, our writers, they tend to shy away from, um, politics. I mean, the most famous one of that in which he merged politics with his art is uh, Dr. Rupert Rupnawine, who subsequently became um, head of the WPA and then a government minister. He was into literature. He did his PhD in Dickens, um, but he was full, full into radical politics. You don't find our artists and sculptors and novelists and movie producers doing these kinds of things. And I think that is where you stand out. You stand out very much. Let's go back now to your trip, your, your hiking. Whenever you tell me, I think in 1980, uh, you said you're going back to Latin America. Uh -huh. um, weren't you scared that what happened to my friend in Bar Street, that those guerrillas would have killed you? Well, Freddie, I left Guyana when I was 18 years old. For the very first time in 1971, after my father died in 1970, I left. And I had grown up in a way where I, where I wanted to see the Amazon region. I wanted to see the Andes, these big, huge mountains, you know, that I saw in the Tintin book. And I said, someday I'm going to travel these places in South America, and, you know, and that's that's what encouraged me to go through the Andes. But the experience I had in the Andes was, um, was beyond my wildest imagination because, I mean, it was just um, it's miraculous that I got through the Amazon. And if anyone still knows geography, would know that when you travel from Bovista to, to, um, to Caracari, at a point in time from Caracari to Manaus, there was no road. There was way, they were now making a road called Experimental North, and malaria was killing people left, right, and center. And I walked the road there, and I, and I got sick, and nearly practically died along the way when they were building it. Some of the road builders had to pick me up out of the streets. So I got to say that I got about nine lives, like the cat, because I survived it. And then I went in a, a vessel, and I went to Manaus. And from Manaus, I was going out to Humaito, and practically about 600 miles, we had to travel right through the dense Amazon jungles. You know, it took about a month to get through the, the places because there was no road. It was just a, a trail. There was a part in which we were building and there were such massive, monstrous snakes that we saw, but we didn't get any problems. It was, there were several of us. Four, at first, four Brazilians, an next guy in me, and a Dutch man. And we, the, the thing broke up along the way because we had um, problems with the Brazilians because they didn't want to walk at nights, so and we had to walk at nights because we said we got to get through this jungle, right? And it's not good for us to stay, you know, one place all the time. So we kept walking, and the Brazilians stayed behind, and we made it out. But I understand that subsequently that only one Brazilian came out we met, and three of them died along the way. But it was a treacherous journey, and the Indians, the indigenous people, um, helped us a lot in the, um, in the jungles. Um, my first exposure to the sculpture right, would have been among the Anaconda Indians, indigenous set of people, big, tall, totem with an Anaconda snake, and we spent some time with them to recover back, you know, and recuperate and to continue the travels. But that's, um, I figured that being among the indigenous people and among the Anaconda people too, right, um, it was, would probably give us a kind of like a safe passage through the jungle because they, um, you know, they being with the people themselves. They were friendly people, and we had no problems with the animals and the beasts and things that we saw along the way. So we survived the journey and met as far as Humaita, and from there we got a road to, um, to Porto Velho and to Bolivia. 
and the jungle was the place out. where um, Che Guevara was uh, captured. Guevara and had, but when I went there, it was time. It was a terrible time. It was time to balance the dictatorship. So Strasner was in the other side. Part, in Paraguay. In Paraguay, yes. Alfredo Strasner, the old dictator, he was there for the longest, probably, but toward seven years. But we didn't cross over there. Went into Bolivia and crossed into into um, to Peru, and then into um, Ecuador, and then into Colombia. Then I came back through Leticia, and then went right up the Amazon. So I crisscrossed the, the Amazon a lot of time. I went back to Manaus and Santa Rosa, and then to Belém. And the hardest part of this journey was the journey between Belém to Brasilia, which was about three thousand four hundred kilometers. And I tried it. I tried three times, and I failed came back sick, you know. The fourth time I, I told the priest, I said, look, I need to meet the, the Imperatrice. If I can cover 500 miles, I can do the journey. So I was 500 miles away from, from Belém. So I can't turn back and I got to go forward. I got about 3,000 miles more to cover. Well, I tell you, I walk, walk and walk and walk and walk until my foot, foot completely torn off, you know, and there's nothing left, sir, at such small church and I went to the priest and I said, Father, look, my foot is in a terrible state. You know, it's all torn up. He said, my son, go and pray. <laughs> so the guy sent me to church and he, you know, and um, I went and I did likewise. And he, I spent some time with him, but I had that orientation in the, in the church because I came from St. Pius X Paris, and you know, and I, I was at the service, you know, Good boy in those days, a bit with him, um, Dennis Canterbury. Good, yeah, good Catholic. Yes, yeah. yes, and we all um, from East Ramfell, we did, you know, be, were part of the Catholic Church. And the, you know, I helped him out a lot in the church, and then I took the, went along the journey into another state, Minas Gerais. And there was a very um, dangerous place down there. You know, I had some very bad experiences, you know. So I'm, I'm writing a book right now on, a, on the South American, in which I described um, some of my, 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 um, experiences along the way, right? But it was more dangerous traveling by road than it was by travel by in, in the jungle. Because with the jungle, it was more at ease, but when it was, with, among civilization, among people, I found that people could be very dangerous. You know, because some people set me up. People I, could be very dangerous. People are dangerous. Not dangerous, but you know what I did? I saw some people playing cards, and I said to them, I might not, I need a place to stay for the night. And they sent me up in the, in, into the to the hills, into a attached house. And when I went in, I was so exhausted, and I, I lied down the night. And I was sleeping, and I felt some things moving around. And when I got a, I ran some light, and I lied like this. I saw some big snakes. I saw goodness gracious, and I got out of this place. So they I sent got, you there for the snakes? That... Yeah, but the snakes didn't do me anything, because when I came in, I, I came in, but I, I, I got to say that God be with me, whatsoever it was, divine intervention, or it was with my experience with the Anaconda people that nothing, you know, I wasn't harmed. But when I came out back, I felt down the hill and bruised up completely my skin, you know, and they watched me and they wanted to know, surprise, how I survived. But my, I don't know, I didn't time with them. My skin was all burnt, bruised up. And, you know, so you that had was, a bad experience with that human was a, a bad homo sapiens. Yeah, yeah, homo sapiens. But going along, the next village is even worse, you know. So I'm going along the way and you know, battered, abused, bruised, and I'm going to the next settlement now. And in the next settlement I'm meeting, this is supposed to be, supposedly is between the state of Man uh, Minas Gerais, Anguayas, just going deep down in the south of the Brazil. Because I'm going to meet up now, go in there, you're going to meet up now in front of you, and that place in Brasilia is up ahead, it's still far away. I had another very bad experience up there again. You know, and... But well, what about, um... So, anyway... Oh. Anyway, from there, right, I met some good people because you're bad, bad people and good people. And uh, I told the guy, Hi Mundo, you know, he had a little farm and his sister and little child. And, and he said, Man, I got a ranch. And I stayed in the ranch for about four months and helped him out, you know, doing odd jobs around the, the place, tending to, to him, cows and learning to learn some. I never, I, I tried to, to ride a horse and it fell off. So I didn't, I didn't go do it again. You know, it got hurt myself. And from there I went on, paid me, and I went on to um, to Brasilia, and then things, things started to change for me when I went up in Rio. In Rio, I spent about four years in Rio, and in Rio I learned a lot of things. In Rio, I became more uh, adjusted. You know, I learned the Portuguese language well. I did a literary course, 
in which they, um, I was able to read and to understand the country in which I was living in. I saw how was, was inflation was was very first time I was exposed to such thing. But I like places like Belo Horizonte was a miserable place in which people were coming from the south of Brazil, from the north of Brazil, in fact. People who were, you can read this, they say they were kind of literate people, farmers and so on. And they came to um, Belo Horizonte, which was the first um, industrialized city um, in Brazil. Yeah. And there was such poverty, I never saw poverty like this. I'm young now, going into 19, right? And I'm, I'm looking and seeing poverty in which people were waiting in the hundreds for, to get a But looking to, back, looking back at um, your trips to, yeah. in South America, you like South America, you like Latin? I like South America, yes, because I like more in Rio because of the people, the people down you there. You like Brazil more than the other South American countries? Not, I like Brazil, but South American countries like like Colombia, you know, Colombia is Colombia is a nice people. Ecuadorians are nice people, but places like Bolivia and um, Peru, they have um, Aymara and Quechua Indians, and you don't actually get into these people so easily unless you can speak a language. Okay, Gildavi? You know, I, I, I we we have a show here, and it's uh, we ask questions, but it was mesmerizing listening to uh, that's how I met him. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was he stories. He was Do you know that uh, we have our bush there, I'm pretty soon. And if you guys have never been to the bush, you should take when I say the bush, our hinterlands, and see the beauty of the trails, and just sleep at night, drink some of the creek water, and eat some of the high mara fish. Um, go across to Brazil. Drive from the Brazil border if you can get somebody to drive and see a different part of the Amazon. But I grew up reading Tintin and Tarzan, and I played video games, Lara Croft, um, and Indiana Jones with my kids. And I love to read stories about exploring. Uh, Tarzan has always had me the images of um, you know, uh, in in the in, in the hinterlands and how we would have lived with animals and so it's good. Um, and I looked at you and, and I say, I start thinking back about the people that we have in this country, uh, about the Dave Martins, the Martin Carters, um, uh, we're gonna have within a very short while. We spoke the other day, I think recently, to our actor Mahadja Shivraj, and uh, a few months back, we had some actors here. And it, it pains my heart a lot that we can't start, or we haven't really shown the kind of appreciation for our arts and the artists. I look at the the, the, the the images, the pictures of some of the work there, and just looking at one of them, the amount of work, the love and the labor and the hardship that you would have gone to procure the materials to make it. I want to ask you a question. What's the most money that you ever made on a piece? Well, let me tell you that um, most of the pieces, right? I, I, I don't want to say I'm being evasive in terms of the most money that I made. No, if you don't want to answer, don't answer. Because That's a personal here, here, question. here what happens is like this. Governments don't buy my, my work, mainly friends. And therefore, it may be like, at times, it's a hard time and, you know, and... At times, you, you receive at least, let me say in terms of U.S., it's $300, $60,000. Well, please, $60, dollars. that okay. okay. $60, There's a reason I ask you that. That big piece of work that was at, that is, is at the... United Nations. Not the United Nations. The work That's at, the land that, house there? At, no, at Marriott Hotel, right? There's yes. a big piece down there. I am, I had approached the, um, the government to buy that piece of work, and I went to them to... It was Anthony, Frank Anthony then. The, the name of the work was the history guy and he struggled. And I look at the guy in his history from the early stage, from the 1600s to um, right on to um, 1992. And he said, man, the history of the guy in his struggle. And he said, what are you talking about? There's no history of the guy in his struggle. So they didn't buy the work. And I had it in the African Museum there for some time, you know, and um, then a guy came along, a middle guy come along and said, look, I want to buy the piece of work from you. Now they didn't cost much, you know, they cost, at the time it cost about a thousand US dollars, which is 200,000 kind of dollars, which is lots of money for me, you know, because I, I don't see that kind of money like that, right? You know, so that time, that's a big piece of work, it's about um, 10 feet in size, about four feet in height, 10 feet in length, you know, so um, the middle man sold it possibly to Marriott and got a, you know, 
much money out of it, but that's why he said it. That's why he paid me for the work. But it's, it's a working so, so, game. So, so, no, no, I, I, I have a reason I ask you that, Desmond. Mm -hmm. Just for the sake of, of arguments, what, how long did it take? How did you get the materials? You have to buy it, right? I have to buy it. These, were, right. these works, you were looking at, are uh, made of purple hardwood. Uh, so you, 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 these are not discarded materials. Eh? How much hours so, did you put into to make the one that is at the Marriott right now? That one is two parts I did it, and it probably would have taken me about a year. A year, and you understand where I'm coming from? How much do you sell it for? So you have a piece of work at the Marriott? Yeah, I got a piece of work at the Marriott. The big piece of work uh, you watch at me, you probably sit on the sofa. And the history guy, and he's struggling. And lots of people don't read at the bottom and look at it and see yeah, that. You have seen, seen it? You have seen it? I think I remember I've being there, never paid attention. I've never been, I've never been one reading for that, but I have to pay attention. So if you look at Christie's, yes, I probably have to pay attention. When you look at Christie's and all those big auction houses and then you see big paintings, big art pieces going, millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars, Michelangelo, Da Vinci Picasso, and you look at the sculptors and so, they, they, they're collectors who pay bundles and we look at Guyana. Now one could very well argue that we don't have a big uh, collector's circle in Guyana, but surely there must be an appreciation for somewhere for a piece that took a year to make it sold for a thousand dollars. You understand what I'm asking? What do you uh, get for it? Yeah. Um, you, you, is it here so we could? The, the piece at Marion? No, no, no. It's you, not here. It's not here. It's not here. These are much smaller pieces. Okay. But this but you understand that, Freddie? This one, a, a mm. piece that took loving, uh, a lot of pains this, and this hours, one, what, this thousand one dollars? approximately um, $35,000. Okay, let's, let's that, show. That was a piece of work, right? Let's show. Um, that, how much hours that took? That, that would have taken me about, um, probably about um, a month. A month. Some, yeah, about a month. That work is on decolonization, is the colonization in the New World. It would have shown both, would have shown some things in terms of the animals, right? And formations of the New World. And you, you show some of the developments going on within it. Let me, let me I'll see it from there. Well, we have to show so you. You got to show the people them doing the mm. same thing, right? Yes, their movement. Wow, inside, yes, that's so pretty At the good, same yeah. time, shows the colonization going on inside. One got to understand that time. So this, this is one of the people. We're going to show you the kind of work this guy has. Some all over the place in Ghana. I think there's a piece of Castellani house, Castellani. Right? No, this is hardwood, yeah. This is hard purple hardwood. So you, the tools got to be very sharp to, to get this kind of cut in it. Because most Guyanese artists shy away from using this. They, they do use a, a semi-hardwood, which is a um, mahogany wood and salmon wood. This wood... You can easily cut, but this wood here is a very hard wood. I figured that's the wood at them. When I did after, I spent two years working on a tall piece of sculpture, was responsible for the the, the problem that I got on my shoulder. Oh. Well, but let's got, look. Um, yeah. Let's look at a younger Desmond Ali. That's a concept of the regional integration monuments. Now, when we talk about regional integration, right? Here it is that I, I have a vision of the regional integration monument. Now, the piece down there, right, would have been Guyana playing an essential part in the, in the integration movement. That's from developing from, from the theme of Guyana continental destiny. Because I'm looking at it in terms of Guyana's geopolitical situation in which we are here in South America, the only South American English-speaking country in South America, which can be able to influence trade relations with other South American co countries that need to go to the Caribbean. And this here, right, Guyana can play an important part. And these here, right, other other parts, the other parts then would have been Central South America, but they're all done by, you know, pre-Columbian motifs. But realistically speaking is that our foreign policy and our place in South America places us strategically, like, I mean, how the American looks at us in terms of Guyana geopolitics, is that we can be able, with our road, as I was looking at it, is that we can get trade from Bolivia, Paraguay, and all these countries, in particular Bolivia, which is a landlocked country, that, that can be able to bring trade relations and, and we can be able to play a part in the integration movement. This is where art is, you know, and this is the part in which, as an artist, I advocate and say, Talk about Guyana's continental destiny. You said something, Desmond, a little early while um, Freddie, um, uh, he said something, I think, before we started the show, uh, Desmond, about the American embassy. And and that thing kind of strike a card in me. Imagine an artist in Guyana. I'm going to challenge you guys here today. 
an artist in Guyana went in for an American visa and he was recognized by somebody who's interviewing him for that visa. And that person recognized him and he would have probably, that would have probably played a role in him getting the visa. But here is what I'm going to ask you guys today. How many of the viewers out there today recognize Desmond Ali? And how many of you could say to me, name five artists or sculptors in Guyana? It's a very, very sad uh, scenario that we have in this country. And we have to do better than this. Continue, Felix. Yeah. Um, what's the piece that... Uh, I know there was a piece you and I visit. You sh I went there with you. It was standing conspicuously in Castellani House. What's the name of that piece in Castellani House? Oh, that's the, um, the National Unity Monument. Is it here? Yeah, we have it here in the... Um, we, 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 no, no. No, no, no. Oh, we oh, have oh, this, that, this, that. this way of looking This at. is in Castellani. This is permanently stationed at Castellani House. This is Desmond Ali, Monument to National Unity. Put it back, let's see. Okay. Wow. How long this piece took for you to make? That piece took um, about three years to make. That, that work was done um, with my own savings, right? I just want to talk about it. And, um, him, Raj Kisun, assisted me too, as well as uh, a From man the Kisun called, Company. Yeah, as well as a man called... Um, he's died. Um, Gobind Duarco. I know that and name. Gobind Duarco. He died oh. early. He died young. And the Colombian ambassador, Hildago May, May Garcia, he bought a piece of work for me. And I put it together, you know. So it took me some time to put it. But the government didn't didn't, um, didn't do anything at the point in time. How much did that cost you to, to put together? And that thing would have probably cost about $1.5 million. And you know? if I may ask, mm -hmm. if, if you want to tell us, because I'm trying to paint the picture here. Mm -hmm. How much would you have been able to sell it for? I never sell um, it. Did, this um, was donated to the to the to the Guyanese people. I don't. Oh, you did it up your own to my, do that. Well, yeah, Forgive me, I, I I'm not too familiar, and so I'm, and, and it shocks me even that you would say that a man who doesn't have much money would go into his pocket and give it to the love of the people. But this, this is at Castellani. Freddie Kisun, you understand what I'm saying? This is at Castellani. House. This is out of my savings when I came back from um, Latin America when I come back in 1990, I had some money that I worked in Colombia. I used to work in Colombia? Yeah, I used to work night. I used to work, you know, the best time I used to get paid for my services, I used to got pay from work from 10 to 12 o'clock and I would get then 20 US dollars. Eh? So 20 US dollars, a lot of money. And I would get to work and I would get two, two, um, two such, such um, sessions between 10 to 12 and, and the place is dangerous because I was in Cali. And Cali was extremely... Cali, that's yeah. the cocaine capital. Yeah, was, <laughs> so, I wasn't very far from Medellin. I was just about, um, about, do you say, about four hours away from Medellin, and Medellin was even worse. So, but I was in Cali, and I had to walk back because... Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Medellin is the arm, um, mm -hmm. the cocaine yeah, capital yeah, yeah, of That was not very far from Cali, because Cali is a beautiful place. But I had to walk back to where I was living, and, and many nights I saw people getting beat up, you know, and, and I, I always tell myself, look... I'm passing these people, and they're not seeing because I'm invisible. <laughs> you know, in a way like this, and, and my friend used to tell me, he said, how you manage to do it? Because I'm looking and I see people get, I'm working on the bridge, and the bridge doesn't have lights. It's dark. You know, it was only one Sunday I was coming back, and then this guy came up to me, and he had a knife. And we were on the street alone, and he, he looks like a mad guy, and he's, you know, and he's, Shaggy and everything else, and he took out the knife and he approaches me, and he asked me, he "Say, you got a cigarette?" Um, I say, "No." You say, "You got money?" I say, "Yeah." You need cigarettes? I say, "Look," and I give him some money, and he say, "Okay, thank you," and he got. Well, he didn't rob me. I just gave him the money. Um, this is the piece I like, uh, uh, um, and I, I I don't know where it is, but these things, Desmond, these things are very expensive. I mean, for all the years. I have known you. I have never asked you. I have never patronized you because I thought you don't have the money. I've known you for the five years and I've known your paintings for more than I can remember. But the gods of war is the one that I like. Look the gods of war here. That work is a, a fusion of what you call it, pre-Columbian as well as Puranic art form. That's the gods Asian, of war. You Asian. could be huge and beautiful this thing. Where's this piece right now? That's a lady by the work from Queenstown. You know, not very far. Away look, look, the gods. 
at war. Mm -hmm. This guy's sculpture is always infused mm -hmm. with Latin American history. Well, he hiked all over Latin America, had nine lives like a cat. So I guess Latin America will always be in his... Uh, this is the back of um, the uh, photograph, but essentially this is the gods at war. Private in, in private ownership right now. Now, um, there is a piece you have when you enter the National Park from home stretch from Carifesta Avenue. Where is that hill? That, oh, no, 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 that's not my piece. Of that's work. not that's your a, piece? No, that's a design I, I, um, I gave to a friend of mine, and he, he worked in it. Oh, you gave that design, but uh -huh. the government bought that? I figure and, so, because I wasn't oh. well at the time, and I couldn't work in the, the work. And I did give a design to the, to the government then for the work. Um, this, this is a nice piece here. I guess this has been sold. Yeah, that piece is sold. Uh -huh. that, that was a piece called the, but, the Mighty Warrior. The Mighty Warrior. Yeah, there's a side view to... Uh, of, uh, Desmond, how many sculptures are there in Guyana that you know about? Oh, well, most of what remaining, we only have um, Lyndon Gemont, who is a very good sculptor. And we have Winslow Craig. Mm -hmm. We have Oswald Hussein. Those are... We, I don't know what's happened to Van Dyke, but he's a big guy in his 70s now. We have George Hope, who is in his late 70s, and he's no longer a sculptor. He's doing gardening, but he, when I came back, I saw him, and he was doing some very good work. I, I, I want to ask you something personal, and this has to do from an artist's perspective. When you invest... Uh, so much of your uh, well, let's say not money because you you would have um, like, but you put a lot of work, a lot of hours into it, and then you give it out, and I consider that to be very paltry sums. Uh, what are your thoughts at that point? And there's something as beautiful as that you 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 started from scratch. How does that uh, uh, resonate with you? Well. As I said before, mainly friends of mine who buy these works, and I feel figure that they have an appreciation. Okay. You know, recently a friend of mine came back from abroad, and he, and he said he wants to open a studio, and I said, well, I got my work in my storage place, and I don't have much a big place where I'm living, so I don't have much of a storage. You know, and I can't keep these things, and I need, especially for, at my time now, I, I need some money for my medical expenses and offsets, some things that I had to do. So I had to part with it, and, and parting with it is like you part with a bit of yourself, you know, because I like it too. I like to see it. I like to look at it, and I feel, you know, you feel strong with it. This is energy. This is the force. Mm -hmm. And you say force, eh, in Spanish, eh? Force, no, no, no hablo español, eh? Uh, <laughs> un poco, un poco. <laughs> um, this piece ah, here. I still have that piece. This At piece least. here, this piece, this got to be expensive. Yeah, there's a big one, and that one took me some time because it's built in a, it's called the, the cost. How the, tall the cost, is that? That piece is about five feet tall. Five feet tall. Yeah, and, and it has a pyramid building built up. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it'd be very stable on the ground. It's very stable on the ground. So it's um, it's called the Cosmic Warrior. But here it is in this work, right, that you have African, pre-Columbian, right, Asian, Forms inside, and at the back of it, it has a part in which it shows this we call a cosmological part of it. So, right? what would be this? What would be the name of this? There's a, the cosmic warrior. The cosmic warrior, mm -hmm. piece of sculpture by one of Guyana's enduring sculptor. I've known him for four to five years, and he's been doing this thing for four to five years. Um, but before we come back to uh, his work. What about our days um, in political activism? I, I want to know um, which direction you have gone in and which direction I have gone in. We have certainly changed from the days of those vibrant days in the streets. I remember you were the chief. You were, this is interesting. Desmond had a position in the 1970s, early 80s, as head of the brigade for sharing out the WPS publication. WPA had a, um, a weekly publication called Day Clean and Open Word. 
and you were the head of the brigade to distribute that um, those pamphlets. Do you remember that? I remember that. When, when I came back in the country, and um, it was about, about three months after, and in February 1979, it would have been, Walter Rodney came into East Rome Fair. I was, I was then carving a map of, um, of Africa, and I was working on a mango trunk. But that was a very sustainable material. So I had to get, I, I started with a jamun. Nevertheless, he came with a guy named, we know him, we know him as Camo, right? Mm. Dennis Canterbury. And yeah. he came with Azad. And I saw the very first, the very first time I'm going to meet Walter Radney. And he said, oh, the sharing day cleans out. And I said, okay, you can come inside. And we had a talk. I'm a, I talk about my experience in South America, you know. And um, I had in, when I was in Rio, I had some, you can see, not political activism in a sense, because I worked with them with a literacy group. And we, we would go to parts of the, the ghettos in, in Rio and try to educate Brazilians, and that was not a Brazilian, about their own language. And then I got into reading more about the, the affairs, you know, in the country. So I, was, I already know, knew about going around and meeting people. Ordinary people. So when I met Walter and, and came, next day he came back to me and he came alone. And I carried him around in my area in California. And from there, I took him into Warlock and he met some other young people. And from there, we brought out members who af afterwards became the brigade, the distribution unit to the Working People's Alliance. You know, in those days, they had only Rockcliffe, who's the driver, Bonita, and Daye, Rupert, and, the, and then Karen, you know, Adeshina. Osase, those, it was a very small organization. And in, in Some of them, them have died, Adeshina. Adeshina died, died yes, and yeah, Osase yeah. died too. Osase, Osase died. was a member, the, um, Osase was a member of the brigade too. Yeah, but I know you, you headed that brigade, but, um, but, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, get, get that No, 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 no. I am looking here at all the pieces and I think about the life of an artist in the end. Um, let us talk about that. Um, uh, maybe Freddie Kisun could probably show. Well, this is a nice piece, yeah. You, oh, that was the same piece on the um, oh, on the mighty yeah. warrior. Oh, the mighty you, warrior. you would surely would have had to be recognized by somebody. Freddie Kisun, could you walk us through that? I'm interested oh. in the kind of recognition there's no would have had over the years. Oh, surely a government cannot be blind to that. Oh, in the in the eighties, in the eighties, um, he really he really blossomed out in the eighties, and I think his political activism helped to push his helped to make him known because. Let me put it correctly. His political activism accelerated the accent on his art and therefore the focus of people on his art. And all the time we were in, uh, as, as young people in the 70s and 80s, his art was known. The, I think the trouble with Desmond Ali for the years that I have known him, um, and this is, this, this is why we have stuck we have maintained that relationship. I don't know many artists as closely as I have, but I think the, 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 the nature of this gentleman here is not really to enter middle class society and get middle class people to buy um, your art. If Desmond Ali, the Desmond Ali that I know, the talented Desmond Ali that the ta talented Desmond Ali that does uh, and has been doing this. If that Desmond Ali used to penetrate middle class society and know the, 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 the petty bourgeois, uh, the petty bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie, these pieces would have been sold and Desmond Ali over the past two decades would have been kind of um, financially comfortable. But for the decades I have known him, he has always stood in the side of ordinary people. His friends were ordinary people. I have known sculptors who would have had these pieces so long ago because of the class society they mix in. And that is why these are people, Leonard Gildari, that you call unsung heroes. Very talented, but you look at them and you see they jump in a minibus, they take a taxi, They've never been part of middle-class society. And that is what is so enduring about 
people like Desmond Ali. That is what is so enjoying. When Desmond was producing multiple pieces, right, he was with us in political activism. I am absolutely sure in those days in the late 70s and early 80s, I've never seen him mixing with the class society. Have you he mixed with people like us. Yeah, not a political award. I got a national award. No, for national award. Is national award for sculptor, yes. I got a national award for sculptor. In, 19, in 1987. 1987. That yes. would have been and then, um, Desmond Hoyt? Would have been Desmond Hoyt administration. Oh. But then they were very, it was very competitive then. I had to face with Philip Moore, who was there competing. Owen oh, Wallen, Lumumba, and Gary Thomas. The work, the work I came up with was called, um, was on World Affairs. And it looked at the political affairs, and it was done in Mahogany. It was a big piece of work from the very first time the people were looking at world affairs in sculpture. And this is what I'm saying, that what I, what I did was to infuse in Guyanese art, I don't want to use the word politicize, eh? infuse in Guyanese art that politics played a part in art itself, and we can be able to, and, and, and I was I put it, putting forward a position that in which art could play a form in transforming society itself. You know, so this is part of the educational movement away from art being something merely for the sitting room and for the, use the word bourgeois aesthetics, the appreciation of a nice sunset. But there's not only the nice sunset and the beautiful sunset, there's things in reality that is pervading us and affecting us in society that we need to change. And the arts can play a, a role in it. Like, for instance, when I did the work on the anatomy of a dictatorship, I was looking in particular to the, I don't know where this, this is moving off from it, but it's part, why it is, my work has attained that kind of political outlook because when I looked at the referendum and I came back and I said that, you know, what played out in the referendum, what brought in the Guyana constitution was not really, you know, right. You know, and any changes to the political, to bring about a change in the political in passing, Guyana would have to deal with the Guyana constitution and we must go way back to the referendum. I wrote an article about it too recently in the press. Sorry. And so the, um, the anatomy of a dictatorship and this why politics come into the art and my political background to write has played an important part in it. You know, the consciousness in that. I don't know whether people are, people want to know that art this can play this role in transforming society and art can re be removed from, from the bourgeois conception of art or the aesthetic appreciation of only colors and forms. But Thank what about you. the content? A different kind of thinking. Right. Yeah, but what about the content? The, the object with us here, I figure that we in the new world, we have to shape our identity. We have to break off of the shackles, not to go into politics again, so to say, of colonialism. <laughs> you know, because we are shackled to what becomes neo-colonialism, the new form still of, of colonialism that has kept us in this way, you know, prevented us prevent us from finding our own identity. And, you know, we, we have to find our own identity as a people, with, not within only Guyana, but within the entire region. I think we get in there. Trust me, we get in there. There's awakening of the people. Freddie? Uh, Desmond, these pieces, um, some have been bought. I know you were in Norway. You were in Norway a, a couple of years ago. Did you sell any pieces there? Did the pieces that you no, no, took no. to Norway just was left in Norway? No, no, no. The, the piece came back again. This piece yes. work is in the National Collection. This piece was displayed not only in Tell Norway. our viewers what is the National Collection. Yes, I'm interested in that. The National Collection was, um, was works that were acquired by the Department of Culture and over the years from the National Visual Arts Competition and by then Chairman of the, of the, um, of the Department of Culture, Miss Leonard Dolphin, and then Director of Art... Um, Dennis Williams. So they acquired these works, and in, in 1992, when the PEP came to power, right, they took over the residence and they formed the National Gallery. And these works this became the Castellani House. Castellani, yeah, no, that no, is the, the, Mrs. Jargon's arm. Um, the chairman. President Johnny Jargon's doing. Yeah. Yes, she yeah. um, she made that that did, this became the, the home of the National Collection, a treasure of Guyanese art. It's a very very good work. But this is a work that went to UNESCO, right, and the very first time a Guyanese would have exhibited in UNESCO. That's in yeah. Paris, eh? 
Yeah, um, could so you could we... you repeat that for our um, viewers? Yeah, this is the first this piece of work here. Yeah, it was this is a piece of work that was in, in also. I I, I think it's right? very small. Now. Very small. I should have gotten a big picture. But anyway, this is the work, right? It's it's, this work. it's on art and resistance again, because it's a resistance against European okay, cultural yeah. imposition, right? So um, this is in, work... this was exhibited in Paris. Yeah, yeah. This thing so here was this is this Paris. work here is called on the decline and fall of the authoritarian states. So now this is, came out of a particular era in which there was, there was a struggle for national liberation going and, on. And this is in the national... We How many this, pieces? You have a, a, a few pieces in the national yeah, collection. Yeah, I have about, um, about five pieces in the national collection. Um, Concept of Resistance and um, Patri Liberty and Morir and two paintings. You have... Yeah. Um, you have Two pieces of sculpture yeah. and two paintings. There should be four sculptures in there. Four sculptures. Yeah, and about two paintings. Two paintings yeah. in the national collection. In the national collection. Yeah. Quite, quite... Um, impressive, a, very a, impressive. An ordinary yeah. guy going about his business. And let's hope this, this, this program here, let's hope this program here records history. And let's um let's make sure you see we that, got a flag flying there for right. internationally for Guyana. We will continue, but for those who missed the pro missed the first part, I am going to ask our operator to highlight this. This is a piece of sculpture by Guyanese Desmond Ali that sits permanently in the United Nations headquarters in Manhattan, New York. There is a piece of sculpture in the United Nations that was done by a Guyanese. Very few people knew this. I did know it, and I know Desmond Ali for 45 years. I did know it was permanently in the UN. Geldari, who is an outstanding journalist, the past 20 years, 25 years, didn't know this. For those of you, the thousands of you who are looking at this program, we have an artist in Guyana by the name of Desmond Ali, and he has contributed a piece of sculpture that the United Nations found acceptable to permanently erect. The sculpture is about the invasion of big countries, of small countries, invasion of large states dominating small states, with the center being the 1983, the October 1983 invasion of the United States of the Caribbean island of Grenada. Um, Gilari, time is going. Thank you very much. So two things, and, and let me make an announcement here. If Desmond Ali has a piece in, uh, that we like, I'm going to call out my directors right now from Pixels Guyana Inc. And I'm going to find a way for us to buy a piece as a way. They say charity begins at home. Okay. And I'm going to ask them to come on board with me and we can buy a piece from you. And that is going to be... Uh, treasured piece that we would have of Desmond Ali. Uh, we can't tell people to do things if we don't lead by example, Freddie. And the next thing, folks, um, if we know of a house that is selling for $5 million located next to the four lane, and you don't want it, I want it. Uh, so let us talk about that. And Freddie, it was an honor. I thank you for bringing Desmond Ali. I didn't know about that, and you've awakened in me um, uh, some kind of appreciation. I hope that it, it takes another um, a step from here. Um, an appreciation that we do have people within our midst who, whose stories have to be told, whose works have to be exhibited and appreciated a little more. I don't think people really know, and somebody needs to tell those stories. Thank you very much, Desmond. Freddy? Um, just to recapture, this is The Gods of War. This piece is now in private collection. He has four pieces in the national collection and two paintings. This hair was exhibited in Paris, where my index finger is. This was exhibited in Paris. Some others of his work. Yes, IDB um, too. This is the I, IDB. Yeah, the IDB. The IDB has any pieces in no, there? No, no, no. They displayed work on, on the... Um, this is the Gods of War. This is a very good piece of sculpture. This is top class third world sculpture. And this is in Castellani House, right? 
This is the yeah, Lawrence of Castellani House. This is on the Lawrence uh, of Castellani House. Somebody's mm -hmm. asking for your number. Could you give them out so if you have pieces of good thing, they're asking. Could you give it to them? Two two three four six thirty six. Two two three four six three six. Well, we, we keep repeating that. What about your cell? Oh, you forgot that. I have the yeah. cell. I have the cell number. Freddy Kisun has a Mamelo. I have the cell number. 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 His home number is 223 4636. His cell is 616 4287. Well, let's repeat that and repeat that because people may run to grab a pen or what have you. Desmond Ali, our famous artist. Our famous artist who keeps to himself and infuses his work with pre-Columbian um, and pre-Aztec um, influence. Here are his numbers. Home number 223-4636. Cell 616-4287. Now remember when you call, say that you're calling about um, his, his work. Um, there's one... Uh, it looks like time just ran away from us. Okay. I feel happy that we have done our duty to this country by highlighting what we call the unsung heroes. We have had very famous people on this program. We have had very prominent people on this program. But we have had people who need to be highlighted. People from the small parties, people from um, the medical profession, the legal profession. We have had a, a gentleman here who has made some very nice movies. Movies that when you see them, you know if they were done in Jamaica, they would have... They, 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 they would have Blockbusters. Um, mega, mega fame. Um, his name is Mahadio Shivraj. On Sunday the 19th, Mahadio Shivraj, premier of Brown Sugar 2, will be at Movie Town. Go and look at that movie and see the acting. See the acting. There's nothing, ladies and gentlemen, I know you will say he's a Guyanese and he's saying this. There's nothing mediocre about that acting. One of Mahadeo Shivraj movies that is yet to be shown in Guyana stars our iconic guy, Ron Robinson. It's called Protection Game. Those are movies we should see. And so in that context, I am so glad that we have featured Desmond Ali. I am so glad that we have featured one of Guyana's leading sculptors. It's been an enjoyable journey with a talented Guyanese. Um, we'll be here on Wednesday. We'll be here on Friday. We have some interesting guests lined up, all with the intention of recording history. A country that does not know its history will never be psychologically liberated, will never be mentally free. You can have all the skyscrapers, all the eight-lane highways, but if you don't know your history, you will have everything outside and nothing inside. On behalf of Leonard Gildari, our guest Desmond Ali, this is Frederick Kisun, not Freddie. This is Frederick Kisun signing off. Bye-bye, Tata. Au revoir, of the same. Thank you very much for yours. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you, Desmond. Pleasure, okay. <laughs>